Good evening. Thank you for joining us again in our midweek from Car Baptist Church. Trust you're keeping well. Thank you to Junior for holding the fort last week when we were on holidays. Tonight, as is our custom in recent days, we're looking at a psalm on Wednesday night. And tonight we're looking at Psalm 51. We're going to consider the first nine verses, but Keith Lindsay is going to read the entire psalm for us just now. Good evening. We're reading this evening from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew your right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then will I teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. We'll end there at verse 19, and we know that God will bless the reading of his word together. Let's have a little word of prayer together. Our loving and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for the wonderful privilege that we have of being able to meet together in this way. Lord, we thank you again for your precious word that is truth. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful psalm. And Father, we thank you again for the challenge that it is to our hearts this evening. Lord, your word has reminded us, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew your right spirit within me. And again, Lord, your word reminds us, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, may our hands be clean, may our hearts be pure as we come into your presence again this evening. Lord, we ask for that fresh cleansing and Lord, that we will know just your hand over our lives and your touch over our lives even this evening too. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray, Lord, as Pastor Andrew explains your word just now to us, that Lord, you will bless him and bless your word to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, again for your precious word. We thank you for the truths of your word. We thank you, Lord, again for the blessing of your word day by day. We thank you, Lord, for the promises in your word. And Lord, we thank you we can stand firm upon them because you're a God who never fails us. Lord, many in our congregation need your help today. We think, Lord, of those that are sick among us. We think, Lord, of those that are going through treatment at the moment. We think, Lord, again of those that are lonely and isolated today. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon each one of them. Lord, Lord, that they will know your help, that they will know your strength, that they, Lord, will know your presence in a very real way with them, even today. Lord, we pray again for, Lord, each member of our congregation tonight. We thank you, Lord, again for each person that comes along to the church and is connected with the church. Lord, we thank you that you know every need of every individual. And Lord, we just pray that you'll meet needs, that you'll bless hearts today. Lord, that you'll give strength where strength is needed. The Lord, you'll give comfort where comfort is needed. The Lord, you'll give wisdom where wisdom is needed. The Lord, you'll give us help. Thank you, Lord, today that we can cast our care upon you because you're the one who cares for us. Lord, we pray that you'll bless again Pastor Andrew as he shares your word with us now. 
And our God, you'll use it to challenge our hearts, to bless our hearts, and to make us more like you, we pray. Undertake for us as we commit the rest of our time together into your hands, asking your continued blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. D.L. Moody once said there are two ways of covering our sin man's way or God's way. If you seek to hide them yourself, they will have a resurrection sometime. But if you let the Lord cover them, neither the devil nor man will ever be able to find them again. At a time in his life, King David went man's way of covering his sin. This was undoubtedly ground zero for Israel's greatest king. This harrowing and shameful incident with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. It reads like a scene from a Netflix miniseries. Adultery followed by murder and a convenient cover-up. But this is not a Netflix bad boy or a serial adulterer. This is King David, the man described for us in the Word of God as a man after God's own heart. And undoubtedly in these days, we read in Second Samuel, life was good for David. But like any child of God, prosperity, success, comfort are much more dangerous than adversity and persecution. And at the very peak of his powers and his popularity, David momentarily took his eye off the ball. He stayed at home when the army were away fighting a battle. And you may know the story well. He was having an afternoon nap. He got up and he looked through a window and he spied Bathsheba bathing. And lust took over. And he forgot God. And he forgot the word of God. He forgot the goodness and mercy that had followed him all his life up until now. God's word that he'd hidden in his heart had been conveniently, if not blatantly, disregarded and his testimony is shattered in a matter of a few lust-filled minutes. Uriah had been with him from the start. Even during the time David was a a refugee and a fugitive on the run, Uriah had been faithful and loyal to David. And while he was out on the battlefield, David did the unthinkable. And in the ultimate act of betrayal, David slept with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And the next thing we know is Bathsheba is pregnant and Uriah is conveniently killed in battle. And we see the startling and revealing truth that the best of men are but men at best. And one of the most understated verses in the entire Bible, 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven, we are told the thing that David did displeased the Lord. And yet for a year, Almost a year, this great giant of the faith lived in complete denial. Dominic Cummings on Monday said that he had no regrets about driving 250 miles to his father's farm during lockdown and he had no reason to apologise. No regrets. We're not told if David had any regrets, but it seems inconceivable that he didn't have regrets. But still he went God, man's way of covering his sin. He was out of fellowship with God. He's not reading the word of God. He's not praying. And there's no more painful and lonely place to be. There's no more miserable person in this world than a backslider. Someone who's out of fellowship with the Lord. They've lost their joy, which is the badge of authentic Christianity. And Nathan the prophet confronts David about the abject horror of his sin and he delivers this stinging rebuke you are the man and David in his anguish and brokenness and devastation pens Psalm 51 and it's gut-wrenchingly honest it's jaw-droppingly painful and it's clear confirmation I believe of the authenticity and inspiration of scripture as one of the heroes of the faith is seen warts and all and tonight as you watch this recording or listen online if you feel the weight of your sin this psalm is for you because here we see up front and personal the horror of human sin and yet the magnificence and the magnitude of divine grace and we all need to spend time in psalm 51 thankfully unlike david our sins are not recorded for everyone to read about we may not have committed adultery or committed murder like david but the lord jesus said if we have lust or anger in our hearts that's tantamount to 
adultery and murder. And every day as Christians, our lives are marked by disobedience and defiance. And if there is unconfessed sin in our lives, it will limit our spiritual usefulness, it will quench our desire for scripture, and it will stifle our spiritual growth. First of all, in verses 1-2, to two, we see David appealing for forgiveness. The prodigal is coming home, and he literally throws himself on the mercy of God. He knew that the Lord was merciful, he knew the Lord would forgive him, but he knew he had grieved the Lord appallingly. And he deserved chastisement, he deserved punishment, but he pleads for mercy. And notice this appeal for forgiveness is based on two divine attributes, steadfast love and abundant mercy. David was fully aware of the abundant mercy of God. He wrote in Psalm 25 verse 6, Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been of old. And this appeal is depicted in three ways. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Transgression is rebellion against God. It means to cross a forbidden boundary. Iniquity is a picture of the, the crookedness of the sinner and sin literally means to miss the mark, to fall short. David wants God to wipe away the horror of his rebellion and his willful deviation from God's word. He wants the record of them removed from God's book. There is stain on his life and his testimony. But he also acknowledges that his sin has defiled him. It left him feeling dirty and he pleads, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, just like a stained garment needed scrubbed and washed. David's iniquity had left a, a deep-seated scar in his life and only God could remove those stains. And thirdly, he pleads, he begs, cleanse me from my sin. David here pictures the, the purification necessary for temple worship. Whenever David was at that window stirring down at Bathsheba, he resisted the promptings of God to run from temptation. Sin looked attractive to him. He played with fire and he ended up with third degree burns. David was an intelligent man. David knew God's standards. He knew God's commandments. But he conveniently disregarded them. He was guilty of willful, blatant rebellion against God. And he certainly didn't consider the consequences of his sin. And the truth is there are times whenever we lift the phone to phone someone or to send a text message, to pass on that little piece of gossip, we don't feel the danger of sin. We sense the tantalizing power of spreading gossip and we are in open rebellion against God and his word and we don't consider the consequences of character assassination. We don't consider the consequences when we're playing with fire online. We're tempted to click on that image or that video. You need to fully understand the, the abject sinfulness of sin. We need to constantly cry for forgiveness. It is available. It is accessible. The writer of Psalm 130 knew that with deep conviction. He says, but with you there is forgiveness. Secondly, in verses 3 to 6, we see David acknowledging his sin. They do say that confession is good for the soul. And this guilt has haunted David for almost a year, gnawing away at him. But he was still unrepentant, stubborn, backslidden and far from God. And these verses here are literally overflowing with confession. There's almost, there's honest acknowledgement of sin time and time again. The boil has been lanced for David and this prayer is therapeutic and it's restorative. Verse 3 he says, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Psalm 32 which was written after Psalm 51 tells us of his state of mind. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. He was miserable, out of sorts physically, emotionally, and most tragically, spiritually. He had turned his back on God. And the joy of salvation seemed to be a distant memory for David. And the guilt of his sin pressed into his mind day after day. It was always before him. 
Undoubtedly, David had sinned against Bathsheba, against her husband. He had committed adultery and then murder. He had sinned against his wife, his family, the nation. But David knew of the all-seeing eyes of God. And it was ultimately God who had been grievously offended by David's sin. And it was God and God alone who he went to for forgiveness. And David doesn't whitewash his sin. Doesn't call it a mistake. Doesn't blame his genes or his childhood or his circumstances. He doesn't blame Bathsheba's lack of modesty. He doesn't say boys will be boys. It was a moment of weakness. He says exactly what it is and he nails it. I have done what is evil in your sight. It wasn't an accident. It was an atrocity. It wasn't a slip. It was sin. It wasn't a trip. It was transgression. No shifting the blame. No soft excuses. Heartfelt brutal, honest acknowledgement of sin. And this shows us that ultimately all sin is vertical. Sin undoubtedly ruins lives, it ruins families, reputations, health, nations. But when all is said and done, all sin is blatant defiance of God. And as God's people, it's imperative that we keep short accounts with him. And perhaps there's something in your life, recent or historic, that needs to be confessed and forsaken. Remember tonight that confession is an act of grace, that God runs after us whenever we let him down in our fallenness and in our, in our defeats. In grace, God sent Nathan to David. We should know beyond doubt tonight that if we sense our sin, if we cry out for mercy, we know that grace will come to us. We realise that the, the only one we've offended is ultimately the Lord. Paul Tripp says, you can't grieve what your heart hasn't seen. You can't confess what you haven't grieved. And you can't repent of what you haven't confessed. It's only when the Holy Spirit makes us aware of our sin and we realise that we have a Saviour who is relentless in his pursuit of us. A Saviour who longs for ongoing intimacy with us. A Saviour who is aware of our deepest died secret sins. Yet a Saviour who in grace comes to us afresh and says, I love you passionately. I died for every one of your sins. Thirdly, in verses 7 and 9, we see David asking for cleansing. Once again, there's a tripartite emphasis. Purge me, wash me, blot out. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. In order for a leper to come back into the camp in Israel, a hyssop branch would be dipped in blood sprinkle on the leper seven times at, at the altar and then he would be restored to fellowship. David felt like a leper because of his heinous sin. And he cries to the Lord, purge me with hyssop. The word purge there literally means de-sin me. He was pleading, cleanse me by the blood. Look upon me clean as on the basis of an innocent victim that has died in my place. He wanted the stain of his sin cleansed and removed comprehensively wash me and I shall be whiter than snow this is the language that the the prophet Isaiah would later use in that great first chapter though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool hyssop was used on that momentous night in Egypt on the first Passover the hyssop branch was dipped in the blood of the lamb applied to the lintel and the doorposts and the promise from the Lord was when he saw the blood he would pass over them. God's people were safe under the blood and as Christians God has passed over our sins. We are forgiven people washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian is judicially forgiven because of the cross work of Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The penalty of sin has been paid in full, but we still need ongoing parental forgiveness. And our sin, no matter how insignificant it may seem to us, grieves our loving Heavenly Father. And although we will never face God's wrath as our judge, we absolutely must realise that we will face our Father's heavenly disapproval and correction whenever we sin. 
the day-to-day -day effects of sin still need to be confessed and forsaken regularly. The cross of Christ reminds us of our judicial and our parental forgiveness, which was purchased for us on the darkest day, yet paradoxically the greatest day in history, as the Lord Jesus Christ bore our sins in his body on the tree. The financial implications of COVID-19 will be with us for years, and the value of most things has plummeted recently, shares, pension funds, property, the price of oil, all have gone south. But listen, the cost of forgiveness never changes. The price is the most valuable commodity in the entire world, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. David knew there was only one way back to God, and it was through the blood of the Lamb. He looked forward to the one who would fully and finally deal with the sin problem, the one who would bruise Satan's head. He would look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, David's greater son, the one who, so unlike David and so unlike us, never had to ask for forgiveness because he was perfect. He knew no sin, yet the Bible tells us he was made sin for us. The only way David's transgressions could be forgiven, could be blotted out, the only way his iniquity could be washed, the only way his sin could be removed and cleansed was by blood sacrifice. And the only way we can be forgiven is by the blood. You see, we can choose to cover our sins man's way. But the stark warning of Proverbs 28, 14 is, He who covers his sin will not prosper. Or we can confess our sins openly and honestly God's way. And we will experience the truth of the second half of that verse in Proverbs 28. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. We constantly need to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. We need forgiveness. And there is relief and cleansing whenever we confess and forsake our sins. That's how David began Psalm 32. Blessed or happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Let me ask you as we close. Do you have the assurance that your sins are forgiven. Man's way of covering our sin is through a multitude of schemes. Morality, decency, charity, church. But God's way is through blood sacrifice. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. If you want your sins forgiven, if you want your guilt removed, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you need to go God's way, the gospel way. Repent and believe this glorious gospel message that tells us tonight that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses and keeps all cleansing from all sin. And remember tonight, the blood will never, ever lose its power. We thank God for his word to our hearts. Tonight. Let's have a moment's prayer as we close. Our God and Father, we thank you for Psalm 51. We know that this followed a very harrowing experience in David's life when he fell spectacularly. We know that he went man's way for a number of months. But we thank you that he eventually, according to your grace, came to his senses. And he repented of his sin and he was restored to fellowship with you. We thank you tonight for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We thank you as your people we can ask for forgiveness, we can ask for cleansing and you will restore to us the joy of your salvation. We pray for anyone watching tonight who is a backslider, who has gone their own way, who has departed from the way. We pray that as the prodigal came home repenting, sorry for his sin, the same way David did in Psalm 51, they would do exactly the same. They would come back home to the Lord Jesus repent of their sin and put their trust again in him to lead their lives and to guide their lives. And Father, we pray for anyone watching tonight still not a Christian, that they would understand the message of the gospel in it's all its simplicity and it's all its power that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried 
and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We thank you tonight that we belong to a living Saviour and we pray for anyone concerned in these days about forgiveness, about the assurance of heaven, that tonight would be the night they would turn from their sin and put their trust in Jesus, the only Saviour of sinners. So thank you for your help tonight. Thank you for your word. Most of all, we thank you for your Son. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you.